Welcome to ASRS's Journal of Vitreoretinal Diseases Authors Forum. I'm your host, Dr. Timothy Murray, Editor-in-Chief of JVRD. On each episode of the JVRD Authors Forum, I will interview innovative retinal researchers on their studies featured only in JVRD and how these studies will impact our patients' care in our clinics. Tune in to hear directly from investigators about the clinical implications of the newest and highest quality research in the field of retina. It's a pleasure to welcome my friend and colleague, Dr. Barry Cooperman, director of the Gavin Herbert Eye Institute at the University of California, Irvine. You had a pivotal paper with us, Dr. Cooperman, Retina Controversy, Biosimilar to Biosimilar Anti-VEGF Switching for Retinal Disease. I think you and I both agree this has been one of the topics that is driving the conversation in the field of medical and surgical retina. So first, Barry, thank you for joining us. My pleasure, Tim. Thanks for having me. I know things are, are crazy in the world, and we really appreciate your being here. But I also think that this topic is, is one that really deserves um, extra time from, from you. And we appreciate so much your authors and co-authors for the publication. Barry, tell me, what drove you to, to this paper? Well, the field of biosimilars is upon us, the, era, the age of biosimilars. And this is a paper that I've done in collaboration with a former fellow, Ashish Sharman. I want to give a shout out to him because he's really been the lead of this. He, uh, he did a fellowship with me years ago, spent actually a little time at Baskin Palmer afterwards, and then has been back at India for some time. And India, in many ways, is the epicenter of biosimilar evolution. They were the first to have that ranibizabab biosimilar that had a few bumps along the way at the beginning, and then things sorted out. That was Razumab, and then now there's others. And so we've been exploring together with some other colleagues as well. And we have a series of papers on biosimilars. But so we explore, we explore different themes and topics within this area of biosimilar adaptation. So one of the questions that we are, are certainly aware of that we have ourselves, let alone being asked by others, is now that there's multiple biosimilar choices, what if there's a, you know, inherent confusion a little bit in the approval process of biosimilars, but what's involved in the safety and efficacy of switching from one biosimilar to another, anti-VEGF, of course, and the only ones we have available to date are ranibizumab biosimilars. We anticipate a flibercept biosimilars coming along, but don't yet have those available. And so what this paper explores is whatever switching data that there is. And there's a paucity of data, certainly at least with regards to ranibizumab, intravitreal anti-VEGF, because we've not had enough opportunity to do so. But we explore other areas of biosimilars, systemic biosimilars, and what the experience has been with switching. Part of the approval process has been that you need to make sure that the immunogenicity of anti-VEGF biosimilars, for example, in particular, looking at intraocular biosimilars, is really relatively comparable between drugs. And that's because that's, of course, the big fear that we have in any approval of a new product, product is inflammation, as we've learned along the way and are struggling with now with new products and trying to figure out what the rate of uh, inflammation really is and how that impacts our decision-making making matrix. You know, I think that, that this is such a unique topic because we're talking about a biologic agent. I think when, when we've traditionally thought about generics, um, those, those drugs are essentially identical. But there's been great concern in the biologics that there's more intricacy in terms of the process of development of the drug and the, the manufacturing of the drug. So do we really have reason to have concern? Well, as with any important question, the answer is mostly no, but you should always be aware of the process. And the process is thoughtful. Uh, the proce process within the FDA, it's a different process. It's less dependent on the clinical trials. If they, the classic description of drug development of originator molecules as the drugs that we're used to being knowing, no, using are known versus the biosimilar is, a, is the, it's a pyramid, uh, it's an inverted pyramid for the originator molecules. You do the science, then everything becomes more and more complex as you go on until the clinical trials are at the top of that inverted pyramid and they're long and expensive and drive the price of drugs quite high in a certain sense. 
When a bias similar, it's an inverted pyramid. More work is done on the science side then you do the preclinical work and everything becomes more and more focused. So that the, by the time you get the clinical trials, you don't need to do as much. And that maybe gives some confusion on the part of people because they think the trials are not adequate. But there's so much science behind each of these biosimilars. And there's a huge amount of effort in the manufacturing process and in the immunogenicity, the inflammation process to make sure that those are well controlled. And then there are pivotal trials that are done that are shorter in duration, but have shown consistently essentially identical drawing, essentially identical visual acuity benefit. So it's a process that works, but it's a different regulatory process. What there isn't a sense of is how they compare to each other because there's no incentive to, to compare one biosimilar to another. So all the biosimilars are compared to the originator molecule. And to date, that's always been ranibizumab, of course. And so I have great confidence in the comparability of both of the approved biosimilars that we have in the United States by Biogen and by Coherus. Of course, that's similarly in BioViz, from, similarly from Coherus and BioViz from Biogen, and whether, which are both ranibizumab similars <clears throat> and <clears throat> biosimilars rather compared to the classic originator ranibizumab uh, Lucentis. And we get very comparable efficacy. We have very comparable inflammation. So what the paper discusses is the history of biosimilars and looking at where there's been switching from one to the other and the tolerability, the efficacy, the safety in patients that receive those systemic biosimilars and were switched. Then we apply that sort of a, a sort of a transitive property is to say by implication, we know that we can switch from biosimilar to originator back and forth, whether it's one way or the other, so that implicitly we assume that you can switch from one biosimilar to the other, and there's no evidence to the contrary. There's also one more term that I should introduce, which only similarly has the branibizumab from Coheris, is called interchangeability. And that's a bit of a, almost a syntactical change, or it's a subtle distinction, but it's an important one where an insurance company or a pharmaceutical company or a pharmacy if it was a oral agent could substitute it much like they substitute generics. Of course, a biosimilar is much more complex than a generic. And as you pointed out, the molecule does not need to be the same. There can be a lot of end groups that are different. The receptor binding site theoretically should be either the same or pretty close. It certainly has the same effect, but the molecular structure can be different, but it cannot be different in efficacy or safety and particularly with inflammation. But this interchangeability label that similarly has implies that it could be substituted equally for another bi ranibizumab biosimilar or the originator molecule. And again, the FDA does that after significant safety analyses. So that we have the comfort. So do you feel like it is significant safety analysis? The, the numbers that are looked at, at least in the human trials for the biosimilars, are, are small. And the time is short. Well, the time is short in the efficacy phase, but the safety is usually a year or more. So there is a year of, of safety data in all these, and the efficacy is then followed. The primary efficacy endpoint is frequently as short as eight weeks, but then the study is conducted, is continued, and there's more efficacy data, and then the safety data is accumulated. The answer is yes, because there's a long history of biosimilars being safe, even though, again, if we go back in time, the original, uh, the original ranibizumab biosimilar in India by Intas called Razumab did have a hiccup with inflammation. Then they sorted out their manufacturing issue. And that's not addressed in this paper, but in another paper that we've done together with Dr. Sharma. Um, but the manufacturing characteristics were tightened up both in India and in the United States so that now since that time, there's been no problems. But back to address your question, the answer is as we're learning, essentially all of our trials are probably underpowered to show rare safety differences. And we learned that of course with brolocizumab and we're still sorting that out with uh, peg Copeland and what's going on with Avacyn Captain Pegall, but that's where the marketplace will help guide us. And right. as a community, we're working on this together. And of course, ASRS is a huge and the rest committee is so important. And we all feel quite great comfort, I think, uh, as a community in knowing that those organizations exist to help guide us. 
In some ways, these new biologic molecules and these new biosimilars are driving our focus towards safety. So it, it's interesting, you know, looking at the data safety monitoring committees and some of the post event committees to realize that we were seeing complications that we had never really seen before and and we were, we were looking past them. So I always find that a little fascinating that you have some of the most brilliant people in our field looking at clinical trial safety data and and something can can move along that pathway and not really be recognized during the clinical trial. I agree with a couple of thoughts. One is we've been lucky. We have incredibly safe products. So right. hallelujah for that. That's been an incredible, the manufacturing, the design, we've been very fortunate with the products, even when there are rare hiccups with inflammation. The second one has to do a little bit with the regulatory pathway and how we conduct clinical trials, because we all are experienced clinical trialists, or many of us are, of course. Um, and you know, when you when there is a complication, you use that MEDRA terminology, but the MEDRA terminology is kind of weird. It's easy to inadvertently divide things and call them different things because the names don't always apply. They're not usually the clinical names that we use for, a, you know, you could call it a vasculitis, you could call it an IOI, you could call it a this and a that. And so they didn't always get appreciated or, or lumped together, even by the data safety and monitoring boards, who I think are, you know, made of our peers by and large and are thoughtful, uh, smart people. So that's why the marketplace is so important because we suddenly expand from, you know, 2000 people in a trial or whatever that number is with biosimilar smaller with originator model molecules, they have to be bigger to suddenly 100,000 you know, users in the marketplace, and that's where this emerges. So the post-marketing vigilance and surveillance is critical to our comfort with all these products, I think. And so far, so good with the biosimilars. Correct. And I think that reiterates, you know, one of the true values of the REST committee within ASRS is that many of our members were very comfortable to, to report these early events. Mm -hmm. And it really allowed us to see a, a signal earlier than we might have seen otherwise. So I've got to give kudos to the doctors that, that, that noted this and then were comfortable to, to really share that information. I think that changed at our, at, at our annual meeting in large part, the discussions that we had, but I, I, I think your, your focus though, seems to really bring us back to say, look, this isn't new. We've done this in with other biologics. It may be new to us, but right. it's not new to the field. And the right. people that are coming into play at this in the, in the biologic space are fairly reputable manufacturers within the pharmacologic world. So it makes me uncomfortable. I, I'm uncomfortable for two things. I'm always uncomfortable with new things. I mean, I think that having a, having a hefty degree of skepticism, but the other thing is going to be, as you've alluded to, potentially being told what drug you will have to deliver. You'll choose anti-VEGF and the insurer may tell you which anti-VEGF. Do you see that as our future? I don't know, Tim, it's a possibility. We are, they're already sort of giving a step therapy and that's you know been an issue that some people resist, others accept. There's some rationale to it, certainly. Um, the interchangeability, I'm not sure that, that that will influence the insurance company mandating which drug we use. Um, so it's, it's a possibility. Theoretically, of course, if we think about why biosimilars even exist, the notion is it should have be a safe way to drive down drug prices. That's the reason they're there, right? There's, they're not creating a new product. They're not trying to, it's a, it's a class, it's an absolute need to. One could argue that some of the, as we have a series of new anti-VEGF molecules, they're kind of fancy me too drugs that can charge top premiums, but these are absolute me too's. Their design is that they're supposed to be less expensive. They're not always as inexpensive as we hope they are. But if you look at India, which is again, not our marketplace, but is a large marketplace, but it's a lot of driven by out of pocket patient expenses. Over time, the prices have come progressively down as more competitors join the marketplace. But at the end of the day, these products are safe they're effective and they're meant to drive, bring down drug costs to the United States, which is of course bearing a disproportionate burden of those costs worldwide. And I think you dealt with the, a lot of that historical focus going forward within the paper 
well-written, well-articulated. Barry, thanks for joining us. You're, you're always a pleasure to speak to. You're always thoughtful, erudite, um, and, and really have the intellectual ability to have the discussion that we need to have with ourselves and our patients. Thanks for tuning in to the JVRD Authors Forum. You can watch and listen to more episodes on the ASRS YouTube channel and on popular podcast directories, including Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts, and Spotify. Visit www.asrs.org forward slash JVRD forum on the ASRS website to learn more. See you soon.